My name's Jordan, and I'm 22. I'm a treasure hunter, or, well, I was. After my last expedition, I don't know how much treasure hunting I want to do. I'm writing this several months after the fact, even though I'm still in a lot of pain, and I still haven't completely healed. I've no doubt that my body will heal. I mean, hell, that's what bodies do, right? You put them through the ringer, they heal so your stupid ass can go right back out there and do it all over again. Over and over and over. It's an endless cycle of damage and heal. So, yeah, I'll heal physically and have to learn how to do some things all over again. Uh, there'll be some nasty scars, too. But the mental wounds? Well, I'll be lucky if they even scar over. Let me start in my past. My passion for adventure began when I was 10. My uncle gave me a metal detector for my 10th birthday. And I know some of you are laughing right now, but he was my favorite uncle and I patterned my life after him. I mean, shit. I wanted to be like him when I grew up. He rode a 1990 V-twin soft tail fat boy. He wore a black leather jacket wore mirrored shades, and every time he visited, he had something cool and unique to give me. That metal detector wouldn't help me find a hot girlfriend like the ones he always seemed to have for company, but hey, I was 10. What did I care about that? He liked to go treasure hunting, so I liked to go, and it started out that we would go together. Mostly during the summer when I was out of school and mom didn't have a babysitter. Besides, at 10, I thought I was way too old for a babysitter. Instead of arguing, she just kind of pawned me off to my uncle. He took me to a park and taught me how to use a detector. And then we went to a local baseball field where the elementary schools held little tournaments. I found about... 10 million tops from soda cans and beer bottles during those first few months, and then I started to find pennies. I was excited. I mean, that was some awesome stuff right there. Hell, I'd rush home in the evenings, usually filthy from all the digging, just to show my mom all the dirt-crusted pennies. I must admit that I found more pop tops and chunks of lead, spent shell casings and stray pieces of wire than anything else. But it didn't matter. I saved all of it. Eventually, he worked up to taking me on long treks through the woods and into places where I'm not sure we were legally supposed to go, but that only made it more exciting for me. While we were exploring an old ruined building on a site that looked to be about a hundred years old, my uncle said it was an old moonshine runner's shack. Well, I found my first big hall. You see, there was a mason jar buried about 18 inches deep and full of silver half dollars. It had been buried under the shack which was completely gone except for part of one wall. Well, I thought I was rich when I unearthed that jar, and more importantly, I was hooked on metal detecting. After that, I became completely obsessed with going out every day. But for the rest of that summer, I never found anything as gratifying as that jar of coins. It didn't discourage me, though. I kept at it, just at a slower, less obsessive pace. All of his other habits that I picked up and mimicked over the years, like smoking cigarettes or riding a motorcycle, gambling at pool and poker, I gave up. But not the metal detecting. Never. The metal detecting. I was sure there was something out there just waiting to be found by me. And that something would shame that jar of silver. By the time I was 12, I had mostly given up the childish idea that I might find the equivalent of El Dorado. And by 14, I no longer saw myself as Indiana Jones either. Settling for a tamer exploration wasn't so bad though. At least I didn't have to worry about getting poisoned by rivals or squished by a giant boulder or falling into a tomb filled with 
precious treasures and hordes of poisonous snakes. Well, I live in a rural, and I mean a very rural area, so I had plenty of space to roam and hunt. And most people didn't care to give a kid permission to meddle the tech on their property. As a matter of fact, some of the older people thought it was interesting enough that they followed me along, getting just as excited as I did when the beeping started. As I got older though, people were less inclined to let me hunt on their land. I started getting suspicious looks, as if they wanted to ask if a young man my age didn't have something better and more productive to do with his time. And so, I started hiking the woods and detecting wherever I felt the urge. After high school, I got a job at the tire plant and worked during the day. You better believe though, I still spent two thirds of my free time with a metal detector in my hand. Although I had upgraded to the newest model, it was still the same concept and just as much fun as it had been when I was 10. I found a mason's ring once. That was a good find. Another time I found a woman's diamond engagement ring. My friend Neil told me I should sell the rings, you know, make a little money. But I didn't. I cleaned them and kept them. Put them in a little clear plastic display boxes and set them on my shelf in my living room. Neil told me I seriously needed a life. Hell, he was probably right, but he was with me enough that I thought I wasn't the only one who needed a life. Now, Neil's father had owned roughly 80 acres of land, and most of it was unusable mountain land covered with ancient growth trees. I never understood why he hung on to the land. I mean, why wouldn't he just sell it if he couldn't use it? Neil's dad didn't much want me using the metal detector in his woods, so when I was a teenager, I didn't. But when Neil turned 21, his dad signed everything over to him, made him promise he would never sell it. Three weeks after that, well, Neil gave me permission to use the metal detector around an old house foundation we had found years and years before. It was deep in the woods, and Neil said he would go with me. Now, there hadn't been that much rain that summer. The air was thin and dry. The leaves and undergrowth of the forest were dehydrated, turning brown at the tips, and they clicked like thousands of impatient fingernails drumming against glass. My clothes stuck to me and sweat ran in tiny rivers down my face and neck, soaking my t-shirt. After about 40 minutes of hiking and climbing, I wasn't just tired, I was wary all the way to my soul. But not Neil, he was just as sweaty as I was, but still had plenty of energy laughing and talking, darting off the poor excuse for a trail every few minutes to check if some damn weed was ginseng. Just when I was about ready to give up and sit down on a dead tree near the path, Neil grabbed my arm and pointed at a long, fat black snake where I would have set my feet. I was petrified. I had to fight the urge to break and run in the opposite direction. It wasn't easy, but I stopped about ten yards away and turned. Neil had a forked stick and was jabbing it at the snake. And suddenly, he laughed and swooped down, grabbed the snake right behind the head, and came toward me. The thing spiraled around in its arm, its tail flipping and writhing, hitting its neck. And, uh, well, I wasn't having any of it. Neil wasn't afraid of anything, though. He thought it was hilarious that I was terrified, forgetting about my exhaustion and the heat while I took off running. Every time I looked back, Neil was gaining on me with that damn snake wrapped all over his arm. The path turned sharply. However, I did not. I ran straight into the woods, not caring if I got lost, as long as it got me away from the snake. Looking back over my shoulder, instead of at the ground, I tripped over something hard and immovable. Yelling, I hit the ground with the metal detector and it flew out of my hand, landing in the thick undergrowth. Neil, well, he immediately stopped laughing, 
He pulled the snake off of his arm and kind of tossed it off to the side. And then he came rushing to help me. I'm pretty sure I made up a new curse word to call him. Apologizing and laughing at the same time, he stepped to my side and tripped. He hit the ground right beside me, his eyes wide. We both laughed and, well, that was that. We were good again. As we stood, he looked around. You know what? This is where the house used to sit. This is the foundation or, or what's left of it. He grabbed the metal detector and told me to get to work. Within 10 minutes, I got a hit that wasn't pop top or rusted tin roof or shell casing. Digging down into the black rich dirt about 8 inches, I hit the target. It turned out to be a small metal lockbox. Brushing off the dirt, we could see a tarnished silver cross on its top. It looked handmade and as old as hell. Rust had sealed the hinges and the seam around the lid. It took a while to break it loose, but we did quite a bit of damage to the box. But inside it was the strangest thing. There lay a neatly folded piece of paper. It was a thick paper, not like our notebook or printer paper, but not much thicker. Age had stained it yellowish brown and it felt brittle in my hands. Tossing the box aside, I gently opened the paper. It was a map. If I had to guess, I would say it was 100 to 150 years old at first glance. Now that I've had time to think about it, I believe it was older by far. The cartographer had been talented, but definitely not a professional. There was a river marked, and following its course, I came to the conclusion that it was local, that the map was local, and that there was a small black X high up on one of the mountains. It wasn't a big mark, as if the person didn't want it to be very noticeable. Below the map, someone had written, Seven mountains plainly to see, one to the back, the front two, and three. Four and five to the left, six and seven to the right. Count them out and seal the ground. The mountains hold the secret down. All we could get from that was someone faced one mountain in the north and there were two mountains behind, which is south. Two to the right, east, and two to the left, west. The rest of it probably meant the mountain holds the man's treasure as in it was buried under the X. Turning the map until we got our bearings by the bald face of what's called the Devil's Looking Glass, a sheer rock face that legend says that the Devil used to shave his face in on Sunday mornings, we figured out the approximate location of the X. Intrigued by the possibility of a larger treasure, we headed back to his farmhouse to get his Toyota truck and to head to the X. Now, isn't that what you see in movies and read about in books? X marks the spot, and there's always some huge treasure. Well, we drove for about 30 minutes on an old, rutted government logging road before we had to stop and get out and walk the rest of the way. We had been to the place called California Fields. Hell, everybody around here knows about that place. But the X was marking a place a ridge over from it, to the south and west a little. The uphill climb was hellish, the soil was sandier, and puffs of dust swirled up each time our feet or hands struck the earth. And there were plenty of places where we had to climb holding on to jutted rocks or gnarly exposed tree roots. The dust clung to the sweat pouring from us. And by the time we had reached the top and started down the other side, well, I'm sure we both looked like mud wrestlers. Below us, the trees were just a few scraggly things that looked dead. The soil was sand and gravel and loose under our feet. The clearing at the bottom of the incline looked like it had been the center of some long ago bomb blast. Everything was scorched and blackened. 
Whatever had happened fouled the soil, and nothing grew. Not a single stroke of color was to be seen in that isolated cove. Slipping and sliding to the bottom, we stopped and looked around. The huge dust cloud from our descent billowed out and around us, curling back so that we breathed it in. Coughing and spitting and, of course, cursing. We waited until the dust settled and moved forward to the epicenter of whatever had happened. Have you ever walked near high-voltage wires? I mean, if you have, then you know the slight buzzing feeling that ran through me as I moved toward the center where the earth seemed to have burned to a gray color by heat so intense that maybe it had vaporized all the trees and bushes. There was no evidence that anything had ever grown there. There was no ashes or burned tree carcasses, nothing. Just scorched earth remained. Overhead, a noisy V of ducks veered far to the left and then turned back to the right after they had passed the spot, the way birds are said to do over volcanoes. Something was just wrong with that place. We had worked so hard to get there that I wasn't about to turn tail and run away, not before I had at least tried the metal detector. Immediately. The detector beeped. It was the loudest and strongest signal I had ever gotten with it. I passed the head of the instrument back and forth, following the object's shape to get a feel for its size. It was big, I mean, as in huge. The size made me wonder if somehow a car had been buried there. Neil handed me one of the folding army shovels and we started digging. At first, it was like trying to break through flint rock. Sparks flew from the tips of the shovels every time they hit the ground. But that top layer proved to be thin and broke away like old thin concrete. After that, the sandy soil was pretty easy to move. About 15 minutes in, the ground shifted under my feet. By the time it registered that it might actually be a cave-in, I was falling. It was that one moment when I was rocketing down into the dark, and I saw my shovel hang in the air above me. It was so cartoonish that it would have been funny had I not been in the process of crash landing on something solid. But thankfully, the fall was only about 15 feet, and the sand that avalanched in before me cushioned my fall a bit. But I still tweaked my knee and elbow pretty damn bad. Above me... The hole was opening up, more sand fell to my left, and Neil screamed as the ground under his feet gave way and he tumbled down a slope a few feet from me. The cave-in had apparently been the result of a cave system, which we found ourselves standing in. We were dusting off, wondering how the hell we were going to get out. I studied the slopes of sand that had drifted in estimating the work it would take for us to pile up enough of it to be able to climb up and reach the lip of the hole. Neil had walked past me in a daze, looking cow-eyed and slack-jawed. I turned to see if he was okay or if he had whacked his head when he fell. And then I saw it, too. In the darkness, just beyond where the sunlight reached, there was a sealed doorway, or some kind of opening that had been sealed with a slab of concrete and a giant cross carved into the center of it. Moving closer, we could see that it was only about four feet high and two feet wide, which suggested the opening it covered would be smaller. So, not a doorway. Neil and I had the same thought. Someone had put their treasure behind that slab of concrete Whatever it was, it must have been worth a damn fortune, literally, for the man to go to such extravagant lengths to hide it. Beyond the concrete is where I would find the big oblong shape my metal detector had hit on. Neil and I were going to be rich, or at least gain some notoriety for whatever we found there. 
and so using the shovels to chip away at the seal, and then pry at the slab, we worked until my elbow and knee forced me to stop. The pain screamed up and down my leg, causing me to almost fall. My elbow felt like it was beyond repair. Every heartbeat thudded through the bone all the way to my shoulder. I rested. Neil did not. He kept pounding and prying and scraping. He said he thought it moved, and I had struggled to stand. Using the shovel as a makeshift cane, I hobbled towards him, wanting to see our treasure as soon as the slab was moved. And prying with all of his strength, Neil grunted and dug the toes of his shoes into the ground. Rusty hinges squealed, and he laughed, stood back, popped his knuckles, and went back at it. I was about two steps from him when the concrete door swung towards him and a crack opened. Just, just a crack. Maybe uh, six inches wide. But that six inches, that was enough. There was an ear-splitting scream that burst from behind the door. And then it flew open, slamming into the rock wall in a deafening thud that I felt through my entire body. The blackness formed at the threshold. Neil gasped and took one step back. The blackness took a semi-human form. It rushed with the speed of lightning straight at Neil. I screamed, no! And before the word was fully formed, Neil was no more. Strange, there was no bloody mess, there were no screams of terror. It was a single gasp, and the sound of his sneakers scooting the tiny gravels over the stone of the floor where he stood. And then, he was gone, and the only trace left was a handful of fine white dust that winnowed through the air. But the blackness that did not slow down. It rushed towards me, and I stepped to the side, my eyes cringing shut. The thing bumped me hard enough to knock me three sideways steps, and I rebounded off the rock wall by the small door. My left shoulder lit up with a scalding, righteous pain I'd never felt before. Grabbing for my arm, my hand grabbed out my side. Confused. I looked down. There was no arm. That creature had taken it right off at the shoulder. The wound was cauterized, and only a few trickles of blood leaked out. And I screamed. I screamed until I passed out. You have any idea the horror you feel upon seeing one of your body parts just gone missing? Well... It's about the worst mental anguish you'll ever experience. When I woke, the light was still bright outside the hole, but the sun had moved, casting my little world into shadows. I finally got my cell phone out and called 911. I had to worm my way up a constantly shifting sand dune for the signal, but obviously I made it. I made it out and so did whatever had been locked in that vault. Now that I know what secret the mountain holds down, I wish I had never found that map. But it's out there. Whatever we let out is roaming free now. And sometimes I hear in the distance a high scream that echoes through the woods. And with my remaining arm, I lock the windows and the doors and make sure my crosses are in all places. I don't go out much anymore. I'm afraid to leave the house most days. People, well, people around here seem to think it's depression over my arm, my missing friend, but they're wrong. It's fear that keeps me inside. After all, the damn thing got a taste of me as it blasted by me. Who's to say it won't come back for the rest of me?